Very happy to welcome to Forward Guidance, Mike Green, Chief Strategist at Simplify Asset Management, and Bob Elliott, Chief Investment Officer at Unlimited Funds. Gentlemen, so glad to have you here. Uh, We have been in the middle of a pretty tremendous sell-off in bonds. And I just want to get your sense. Let's start with you, Mike. How has this impacted your investment framework? Are are bonds looking more attractive to you? And uh, I mean, how do... Does this, does, is this affecting sort of a change? Are we in a different environment now that the 30-year is close to 5% instead of 3%? Well, I think we're very clearly in a different situation, right? I mean, I, I had encouraged people to avoid the long end because of the level of inversion that we've seen while thinking the bonds themselves were absolutely attractive. I was clearly wrong on that in terms of the timing component of it. Um, and so in terms of, you know, impacting my investment thesis, I don't think anything has changed on a long-term basis. I do think that a really important point has been raised by those who are highlighting the, the overwhelming supply of bonds that is inbound um, and how that can actually impact the price as compared to the quote-unquote value. I think the, the most interesting thing that I'm really struggling with or that I'm finding is how few people actually want to even entertain the discussion of should they be adding to their bonds now that they're down, in many cases, 50% plus. Um, That, to me, is actually the most important takeaway of what's going on right now. What has caused this tremendous sell-off? Is it because of supply? Is it because inflation and or growth was higher than than expected? Well, I think when you think about uh, the long bond, let's say 10-year bonds, it's really a combination of two different pieces, which is um, the impact of changes in expectations of monetary policy. And we've gone through a few waves of this where, uh, you know, the expectation has been repeatedly that the Fed would quickly shift to cuts, and that has not turned out to be the case. Um, and we've sort of been in the last unwinding of that expectation for this last up bond up move. And remember, when it comes to the volatility of bonds, uh, a fair amount of that volatility happens in the pricing of, you know, Fed expectations over the course of the next couple of years. So that sort of recognition of the Fed policy that's higher for longer drove it. And then, of course, um, there's the additional impact of the supply issues, with which Mike has discussed, um, where, you know, we've had, you know, well, the long end was reasonably suppressed because there wasn't a lot of bond supply, both from the government related to the debt ceiling issue and then the filling of the TGA using bills really for the last nine months or so, plus relatively subdued corporate supply in addition. And so uh, with a little bit of thawing of the corporate markets and uh, the government now needing to issue longer duration to finance the relatively sizable deficits, that's starting to impact the long end and, and create a repricing there. So I'd emphasize basically both of those issues are in some ways behind us rather than ahead of us, given that we've had, you know, most of the cuts expected by the Fed have been priced out uh, for this most recent, you know, move uh, upward in yields uh, in the near term. And then also the duration supply, the increase in duration supply is mostly happening now and I think is meaningfully influenced the existing price. Um, But on a forward-looking basis, you know, the, the dynamics of the bond market and the complexion of it are going to be a little different than what we've seen uh, over the last uh, couple of months. The, the pain in the bond market has been tremendous. Do you think the pain is is over? I mean, is what what, what gives you confidence that that it is over? If your answer is yes, and then uh, Mike, same question: is is the pain in the bond market over? Well, I think what I've said before recently is you know the easy money being short bonds has been made. Um, And the reason why that is, you you have to go to the ordering of how this market is playing out, which is, um, and I think a lot of people may have, like, you may have not recognized this ordering, which is first bond yields rise, that then hits asset prices and the economy, combined with time, uh, interest rates being elevated for longer, you know, for a longer period of time, that hits asset prices in the economy, that then creates a forward looking weakening in the economy which then you know, reduces the need to do further tightening and increases the attractiveness of bonds, particularly relative to stocks. And I think we're sort of in that transition. We sort of moved from a period, say, when, bond, when 10-year yields were in the threes, 
where bond yields hadn't risen sufficiently, they now have risen significantly. We're starting to we're starting to see the weakness in the equity market. That's likely uh, going to be reinforcing to each to itself, and that that then creates an opportunity where you know bonds at this point from a value basis. You know, I I I agree with Mike. Like from a value basis, bonds look you know pretty good. Certainly relative to stocks, they look mm -hmm. uh, glowing relative to stocks in this environment. From my perspective, to turn around and say that, you know, we've suddenly hit that magic level at which the economy slows feels disingenuous to me. It, it, the, the supply story, I think, makes perfect sense, right? The idea that there is a limited response. And again, I would just point out that we haven't seen that much of a move in either the one year or two year yield um, for an extended period of time now. Right. It's really only been since the supply story has picked up. It's not about inflation. It's not about corporate profits. It's not about unemployment. It really is just a story of supply meeting relatively inelastic demand. So you're saying the slowdown in growth has already happened and that it's not economic reasons are causing the, the sell off in the long bond. I don't think that I don't think there's an economic signal that's coming from the sell off in the long bond, other than the fact that the market has relatively inelastic demand structures um, that are very slow to respond to the changing opportunity set. Right. I mean, I, there's just not that much capital that is actually out there that is capable of making the choice between equities and bonds at this point. Bob, what what are your economic views? You've been an economic bull for you know as, as long as I've been following you. How do you think the? But recently, I, I noticed that you have some uh, hints of pessimism in your in your economic outlook. Is is that accurate to say? And, and what has changed? My point about sort of economic bullishness was was less that we're going to experience a boom or we are experiencing a boom, and more recognition that these sorts of like macro cycles just take a long time to play out. And so when we were standing, um, when we were standing in April of you know. 2022 and the tightening started, you know, the tightening was starting, um, you know, the basic idea I was saying is like, you know, it's going to take a while. And actually, if you look at macroeconomic cycles over the course of the last, let's say, post-war cycles, all the post-war cycles, and you start with, you know, how much does the unemployment rate typically rise in the first 12 months after a yield curve inversion? The answer is just a little. Like, and what we've seen play out here in this dynamic is largely consistent with a typical macroeconomic uh, cycle slowing. The, the times that start to get interesting is the subsequent year, right? At, you know, months 12 through 24 are a lot more interesting when it comes to what goes on. And so the economy is, has also been less sensitive to the tightening mm -hmm. than even typical cycles as well. And so what we're seeing is like, just as basically everyone has given up on there being a recession, we're getting deeper into the late cycle of, of the economy. And I think while the rise in interest rates that happened more recently is not solely the reason why we're going to see a tipping of the economy, it is a catalyst. It may be a catalyst along with a number of other smaller fiscal contraction type things like student loans and some other stuff that just is just enough to kind of tip us into uh, uh, a, a more significant weakening in the three, six, nine months ahead. And so that's kind of the dynamic that we're seeing now. And I'd say that I'd really contrast that, you know, the, my turn that a lot of people talked about was I was looking at Atlanta Fed GP now at 6% and everyone saying we'll never have, you know, essentially we'll never have another recession again. And that is just, you know, that's just not the case. And so part of the story when you're looking at, financial markets is you have to bet relative to what expectations are and expectations still even today are extremely overweight, soft or no landing relative to the macroeconomic realities that are likely to play out. Mike, how, what's your economic view right now? A lot of the frustration or a lot of the challenge I think that we've struggled with is, is um, been the language that, you know, it requires a certain amount of time uh, it is, you know, the, the levels of income growth on a nominal basis are too high for a recession, et cetera. Like we've heard that language over and over again. We're in a period of secularly rising prices that inflation is, is um, you know, uh, resurgent is the, the latest we've heard on the, the rebound in oil prices. And unfortunately, I just don't think there's a lot of evidence for that. I mean, every recession we saw in the 1970s, 
occurred from nominal levels of GDP growth north of 10%. So it's not an issue that nominal GDP is at a certain level and therefore we can't have a recession. Um, likewise, the very low levels of unemployment are not at all indicative of very strong labor force growth rates. In fact, if we look at the household survey numbers, which incorporate as a single entity, multiple job holders, um, you've actually seen contraction and very, very weak growth across the overall population. And all of the, all of the job growth relative to the pre-pandemic peak has actually been a function of relatively low-skilled immigration, those who are foreign born coming into the country and obtaining employment in very low quality jobs. Um, so I think I, I look at a lot of the data that we're receiving and the way that we're constructing a narrative of it. And what I really think we're trying to explain more than anything else is why equity prices are so high, why valuations remain robust, and why we haven't seen, you know, kind of the classic sell off. And uh, unfortunately, like you kind of know my position on this, um, uh, you know, Jack, which is that ultimately, I just don't think that there's actually an economic input input going in there, other than as long as people are employed and they continue to contribute to their 401ks, et cetera, it's very hard to get a significant sell-off in risk assets. You're absolutely right about nominal GDP, but looking at, at real GDP, normally you have a, a contraction in you know inflation-adjusted real GDP. And you know, in that bottomed last year. Um, and we had two consecutive quarters uh, you know, last year, but now have, are we seeing a reacceleration? Even if that reacceleration in real GDP growth is only because of falling inflation. Well, again, you know, what, what what do you actually want to do? Do you want to isolate for the idea that inflation is falling? I think that's absolutely true. Do you want to isolate for the level of growth or the rate of employment gains? Those are very different statements, and and under almost any proxy, we have seen a very material slowing in the U.S. economy, right? We've fallen from 10% levels in nominal terms to 5% levels in nominal terms. And because inflation has fallen even faster, we're calling that a reacceleration. Mm -hmm. But under any reasonable metric, the pace of job creation has fallen. The pace of unemployment has begun to rise, particularly if we disaggregate between those with white collar employment, those without white collar employment, those have behaved very independently and in a very different pattern this cycle than they have in prior cycles, which is, you know, ironically, one of the things that I expected and it highlighted that we were unlikely to see a significant increase in unemployment for the very simple reason that we just aren't growing our labor force that fast. It's, we look much more like Japan in that context where our labor force growth has slowed down dramatically, meaning it doesn't take a lot of jobs to keep the marginal person employed. But we, we are looking at materially slower growth. If you, 12 months ago, you said, Jack, describe a scenario, however unlikely you think it is, where we would have a soft landing, I would describe a somewhat similar scenario. Now, I'm not saying that we've landed, and yeah, there definitely you know, could, and then you know, maybe there will be uh, a recession, and it, and it could, could be imminent. But uh, would, you, would you disagree that the past 12 months have given the soft, uh, the, the signs of a soft landing, even if it is a false signal? I would point that there is no rate of change, effectively. The second derivative continues to be negative. Um, and I'm just not seeing any signs of it It move higher, right? Um, we may see a strong GDP print this quarter for a variety of reasons. Um, whether that ultimately turns to be a turn in the process, similar to what we saw in the soft landing events of 1995, or the soft landing events of 2013, 2016, et cetera, we just don't know yet, right? We genuinely don't know. Bob, what, what would you say? Well, I think, you know, the, the, the question in terms of trading markets is what's priced in relative to what are the probabilities, right? That's, that's the basic question. And so what's priced in right now is 2% inflation forever and 12% earnings growth in 24 and then in 25. Like what's priced in when you look at that is like, the most incredible soft landing that has ever existed. And I'll, I'll fade that, right? That That's my basic view is that like, what are the probabilities that that happens? Like, they're not, you know, they're not zero. It's, it's possible we could get 12% earnings growth the next two years. Uh, and there's ways to describe how that could happen. Um, but the odds, particularly given the set of dynamics that I, that I largely agree with Mike on in that, 
when you look sort of under the hood, like the aggregate of the economy across a bunch of different measures is weakening, not strengthening, as you'd expect, given where we are in the cycle, given the response to the tightening that we've seen, the odds that we achieve that soft landing, you know, are are closer to 20% than they are 80%. And the pricing of the soft landing is closer to 80% rather than 20%. And so that's what makes the opportunity set, I think, very compelling for uh, fading this, you know, this recent leg up in stocks, uh, as well as um, as well as buying bonds uh, in that context. One of the things that I struggle with is this whole idea of what's priced in, right? Because if I look at metrics that can actually be traded, I can't trade earnings in the S and P other than through the derivative of the S and P level itself. But if I look at things like dividend forwards, they don't show any growth. Sorry, Mike. I I know just from checking, Bob, Bob's absolutely right about uh, earnings expectations being raised forward. Why would it be that dividend forwards would not would not be increasing if earnings expectations are just that the companies are going to make more money, but they're not going to pay it out? Well, that, that would be one argument, right? It would it would require a change, a further change in policy over the next couple of years, more rapid than what we have seen previously. Um, but also, I would just say that earnings are cheap, right? They're analyst forecasts that ultimately don't mm-hmm. really matter all that much. Uh, and when I say cheap, I mean like anyone has anyone is welcome to their own opinion, just like everyone is welcome to their own asshole. Um, but when you actually look at the tradable entities, the the the, the point that I would make is, is that the tradable vehicles don't show it. They just don't show it, right? We're not seeing inflation break evens rise. We're not seeing dividend forwards and swaps reflect higher earnings expectations. So, I mean, I, I think what, what continues to happen is people offer a narrative for why price is behaving the way that it's behaving. And if, if the S&P is going up, what's a sell-side analyst supposed to do? Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. There's a career uh, incentive to stocks are going up. They, they raise the estimates. So it's unclear, are the estimates causing the stocks to go up? Or are the stock causing the, you know, or is it coincident? I think the way to square it is that um, there is an expectation for aggregate elevated earnings growth that it just doesn't isn't going to get paid out in, you know, in the sectors where the earnings growth isn't concentrated in the sectors that are typically dividend payers. Right. And I, and I think that's how it works, like it, the way it squares the circle. And of course, analyst expectations are always too high because it is cheap. But I think that general idea, I mean, like, look, stocks. When you think about them, particularly relative to bonds, the current stock prices are, are you know, es- essentially, you know, in the last couple of years, like bonds are down 50%, long bonds are down 50%, stocks are off a relatively modest amount. The only way that that works is if people expect earnings to be a lot higher uh, as a function of that. And so I think there's a couple of different triangulations here where the market pricing is certainly pointing us to a world where the people who are buying the marginal S&P 500 contract think that earnings, like the only way to solve what why they're buying it is that they think that earnings are going to be more elevated than, you know, than uh, are going to continue to grow at a relatively healthy clip. Yes, yeah, so price first, narrative second, all, always. Right. I mean, or, or, or you could just flip that around and say that they they don't care. Right. I mean, you know, who who at Vanguard is actually choosing to buy based on earnings expectations? Now that I agree with, which is what non non economic flows are what create market opportunities. I totally agree with you on that. Right. And so the question is, that has now stretched to a point where what's implied is so extreme relative to what's likely to transpire from the economy perspective. Now, of course, in order for that to get realized, you have to have people eventually arbitraging that flow, which is, and, and that that is slower than it was 10, 20 years ago. But eventually you're going to have a situation where, you know, if earnings are consistently coming in below expectations, below those ex- elevated expectations, you're going to have, you know, the closing of the gap between the elevated stock prices and the extremely depressed bond prices. And Mike, under what circumstances does this, uh, Oh, outperformance of stocks over bonds, does that not continue if the unemployment rate is low? Everyone is, you know, uh, they get they get, they get their paycheck at the you know a- end of the month and they're allocating to the 401k. And, you know, their, their Vanguard says, oh, we're putting a large percentage in stocks and a 
tiny bit in bonds and we're not necessarily um, factoring in that we should be overweight bonds now that yields are higher. I mean, I don't know. You tell me. Like this, this non economic flow, tell us more about that uh, a passive flow and under what circumstances will it, will, would it not continue? I mean, for, from my standpoint, it ultimately does boil down to do we continue to change the rules as we have over the last five years to effectively push more and more assets into these types of passive and systematic programs? And do we actually see any meaningful change in that behavior? And, you know, the remarkable thing is go back and just do a Google search, search 401k outflows, right? 2018, they turn negative. By 2019, we completely changed the rules on required minimum distributions. We'd radically increase the number of people who are eligible for inclusion in 401ks. We'd actually created incredible incentives for companies to increase the matching programs. And what we've done is we effectively created conditions under which you know fewer and fewer, fewer people who have the discretion to sell choose to sell, right? And it's manifesting itself in behavior that we're trying to actually assign rational you know, narratives to, right? People look at the earnings and they say, oh, they must be better, right? You know, the earnings must be higher for the largest companies that don't pay dividends. That's actually not what's built into the analyst forecast. The actual expectations are for faster growth in the Russell 2000, faster growth in many of the cyclical areas of the economy that actually do pay dividends. It's just not showing up, right? And so like there is no actual conviction behind any of this stuff is kind of my overall assessment. I think we are largely trapped in, you know, to steal from Rick Bookstaber, a demon of our own design, in which we keep trying to say, you know, what's priced in or how do we arbitrage it? And I would just highlight for Bob, like, how do you arbitrage something like earnings? The only mechanisms that are actually available for, for arbitraging the fundamentals themselves are actually through things like dividend swaps, and they show no sign of the growth expectation. When we use the term arbitrage, we have to be really careful, right? Because it implies a riskless profit. And there is actually no arbitrage associated mm -hmm. with saying earnings are going to end up being lower on the S&P 500. You can make a directional bet and you can justify that directional bet for yourself on that narrative, but that's not an arbitrage. And so, Mike, when you say that we are trapped, when you said that quote, that, that means we, we are trapped, that this will continue over, over the years. And that even if a company, let's just say Apple, well, you know, for, for argument's sake, is, quote, overvalued, then pick your Russell 2000 stocks. And by the way, there are a lot of companies in the Russell 2000 that deserve to not have a valuation of Apple. Um, but th that it's, it, this, it will continue to get more overpriced relative to the market because of these passive flow dynamics. Well, I, yes, I think that that is part of the underlying condition that we actually ultimately have to struggle with is the mechanics of it. The reality, unfortunately, is if those flows do turn negative for any reason, right, if we do end up seeing net supply similar to what we're seeing in the bond market right now, right, the dynamics that we're actually describing when we talk about this is simply a, a, a truly inelastic demand function. As long as people have their jobs, 6% is going to be withheld from them and 3% is going to be matched by their employers. And so you're going to get some X contribution into passive vehicles that mechanically buy in proportion to, in some proportion that's tied to their age, not at all tied to valuation, by the way. Actually, it has a negative valuation signal associated with it. It will buy more Apple when it goes higher in price. Right. Not because of the marginal flows, not because the index itself is actually chasing it higher, but that next dollar in will treat a more richly valued Apple as more attractive than something that has fallen in price. And we, we mechanically see this happening. Yeah. A 35 year old, you know, their Vanguard got them at a 75 percent equity, 25 percent bonds. That was when interest rates were at zero. Now that interest rates are 5. 35 or 95 percent equity, by the way, just to be clear. OK, OK. Uh, when say a 75, 25, uh, portfolio, 75% equities, 25% bonds, when interest rates are at zero, you're saying that, that, uh, allocation Vanguard would not change it now that interest rates are at 5.5%. Uh, well, empirically they haven't changed it. <laughs> yeah. You go a step further. Like if I go to Vanguard, if I go to Vanguard's website and I use their own calculators for predicting the performance of the asset class, it is totally unchanged over the last 18 months. Right, the level of interest rates has no impact on their forecast for bond returns. Like that's a really extraordinary thing when you think about it. It really uh, is extraordinary when you, when you think about it. And uh, whether you were long bonds or short bonds, I, I, I don't care. The fact remains that 
I'm not saying whether they're attractive now or not, but a, a 10 year bond at, you know, close to 5% is just so much more attractive than, than it was at 3% because you're, you get, you're getting paid more and your duration is shorter. Right. Or, or, or negative 0.5% in, if you were looking at European bonds, right? I mean, you know, like we actually know that this is true and yet we don't behave as if it's true. That's the most interesting thing that's going on. There are a lot of non-economic buyers in the bond market. But it extends, Jack, I just want to point out, I want to point out that it extends further than the non-thinking systematic strategies, right? Because we actually are now constructing the narrative. I mean, I did this analysis or, or put out the, I think I put out a, uh, a poll on this on Twitter. And, you know, people's reaction is like, well, the S&P is safer than risk-free bonds, right? Safer than sovereign debt. Right now, why would you actually say that? Right, uh, Bob Elliott's former colleague Andy Johnson and I just had a, a conversation with Dimitri Kofinas, where Dimitri was like, you know, how can I feel safe and understanding of the price behavior of a ten-year bond when it's so much easier for me just to buy Apple? Like, oh my God, this is like what a crazy world we inhabit that somebody would actually ask that question, and and I think that that is more broadly accepted than the alternative. Right. Yes. Bob, at, at what point does the fact that bonds are statistically more attractive than they were a year ago, does that factor in if there aren't that many economic buyers in the bond, bond market? Uh, Mike just talked about 401k flow, flows, passive flows to the bond market, not really changing with yields. I'm also thinking about banks, which bought a ton of bonds when yields were at 1% or 2%. And now the yields are so much more attractive, they're not really showing up showing up to buy that much uh, at, the, at the auction. So at, at what point does the reality of whether it's economic growth contracting a lot relative to expectations, or it's just that, that yields are higher. I mean, wh where are the buyers going to be? When, when will the buyer strike end? What are, what are your thoughts, Bob? I think I'd emphasize that on the, on the bond stock dynamic that we're already starting to see the flows shift meaningfully um, in response to the changes in the prices. Like we've, you know, there's a reason why there's been a massive flow into, into assets like TLT as yields have risen. That's reflective of price sensitive dynamics um, you know, at this point, we're starting, if you if you look at what's going on, you're getting a trillion dollars annualized flow from households, mutual funds, and ETFs, sort of direct and indirect household flows into the bond market, right? And that that level of flow happened when bond yields averaged something like, you know, three and a half percent or four percent, and now we're at five percent. And that's how these things, like, that's how these dynamics work, which is, this is why it, it takes... It takes time for these things to adjust. So we had essentially a bit of an air pocket in terms of the amount of bond supply that was coming into the market and the needed reset of yields to start to draw in those yield sensitive buyers. And that's basically what's happened, right? You know, bond yields aren't going to 13, uh, despite the crazy things that you'll watch on CNBC. Right? I don't know. I saw something on CNBC. The chart look made sense to me, but I want to know who's drawing those charts. That's the best, you know, draw uh, marker drawn chart I've ever seen. Right, CNBC said thirteen percent. Right, like just it, just draw the chart and it and it'll happen. Right, because the reason why it's not going to thirteen percent is because at some point you start to see shifts in demand that are a function of the elevated yield, and so I think the 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 problem, so to speak, that we have seen in terms of the We've seen the dynamics shift in terms of the bond market, right? You're starting to see a meaningful pickup in yield sensitive buying and bonds. The problem is on the stock side, we haven't seen the fundamentals on the equity market shift enough to start to get folks to be essentially scared of what's going on in the equity market, right? We've seen a little bit of a move down in stocks, but we haven't seen the earnings disappointment. And the reason why we haven't seen the earnings disappointment is we haven't really seen enough of an economic deterioration to create that, that earnings disappointment. Now, look, how do right now what's priced in, you know, the expectations are for earnings to grow at something like 25% over the next two years. A typical recession environment has earnings contract something like 20 or 25%. And so that's a heck of a gap. And the way this, the way that that'll work is incremental in nature, which is that you know the the yields rise, the stocks fall, the the economy for those reasons and for other reasons starts to weaken, you know, and it has been weakening and will weaken further. 
And as a result of that, you start to get the earnings disappointment, which creates the downdraft in stocks, which reinforces the slowing spending and the weakening of earnings into the future, which eventually creates a weakening of the labor market, which eventually creates less top line, which eventually creates, you know, an even further downdraft in in the equity market. And that's how these cycles work. The problem is that they don't work instantaneously. Like the, the dynamic I just described is slow. It takes time. It takes time for those disappointments to occur, for companies to respond, for labor markets to weaken, and for top line to start to soften as well. But that's what's likely to transpire over the next 12 to 24 months. Certainly more likely than we're going to get over that same time frame a 25% expansion in earnings. And that's, you know, that's how this is going to play out. So you're in the late cycle camp, Bob. It sounds like you and Mike are in agreement on that. Um, I mean, what, but Mike, how could what you, you not be in the late cycle? Not, <laughs> not to cut you, but how could you not be in, how could you possibly argue that this is an early cycle environment, right? Like unemployment is at secular lows, right? Like, the Fed has tightened 500 basis points. We've engaged in a QT program, right? Like the idea that we're in an early cycle environment does not, it is, uh, is only supported by a total ignorance and rejection of the basic macroeconomic facts that are at play. So Bob, I uh, actually, on the margin, I, I, I agree with you, both, both of you, uh, but it's always possible, you know, for, for the sake of argument, uh, fisc- fiscal stimulus, you know, you'll be familiar with these arguments, so you can just kind of whack them. But uh, you know, fiscal stimulus now is so high that previous economic cycles doesn't matter. The U.S. consumer and businesses are much more sens- uh, less sensitive to to interest rate hikes, as you point out on Twitter often. Bob, we are in a secularly tight uh, labor market, so um, the peak unemployment rate in this cycle may be uh, lower. Uh, you know, those are those are arguments. Sure, and and I think I think in particular. Uh, we saw a situation where there was weak weakening economic conditions, particularly in the second half of last year. Um, and, you know, I think Mike was at the forefront of talking about how the economy was decelerating meaningfully at that time. And what we saw, what we saw was essentially a set of mini fiscal stimulation, fiscal, mini fiscal stimuluses that none of which on their own were all that big a deal, but you add them all up and actually we created an impulse, particularly in January, February, March, that then sort of flowed through to the rest of the economy. But those things like the resetting of the tax brackets, Mm -hmm. um, some of the IRA. Social security adjustment. Yep, the social security adjustment, those three things, those are behind us, not ahead of us. We're not going to have a social security adjustment that looks anywhere near as positive as we saw in the 2023, the start of 2023, we're not going to see the tax bracket resetting be anywhere near as beneficial to households in terms of getting the the intra-year tax cut in 2024. We're not going to see um, the IRA is behind us. The, the main stimulus effective IRA is behind us rather than ahead of us. And so all of those things that created the sort of short, you know, we were on this weakening trajectory we had a short-term pop in the fiscal that created a bit of an extension of the cycle, even to be honest, relative to even what I thought was going to occur in terms of the duration of the expansion, that stuff's behind us, not ahead of us. And that's really what, and at the same time, we've also had, even though it's been less impactful than, than typical, we've had an expansion, you know, we had a rise in interest rates on the long end, on the short end, um, all of those, the globe, you know, global growth is weakening. Like, all of the things that had been supports in early 2023, people are projecting will occur in 2024. And there's no, there's no solid evidence that that will, that will repeat in early 2024 the way it did in early 2023. Yeah. I I mean, I, I I think a lot of the stuff that Bob is saying is spot on, right? I mean, we got an 8.7% increase in social security, the similar, a, a similar wage increase was offered to anyone who was a veteran or, a beneficiary of the cost of living allowances, tax brackets changed, depressing taxes, California taxes were not paid, that increased the quantity of cash that was available. For those who have a significant cash balance, a move to a 5% money market fund has suddenly meaningfully increased incomes. I mean, it's you know transparent, right? I sold my home in June and you know 
some frustration around, did I absolutely capture the peak in, you know, 2021? No, of course I did not. But at the same time, I'm collecting 5% cash on the, uh, you know, on, on the funds that I've now parked in the bank, right? So like, there's a, a really nice win associated with that, that is creating a substantive increase in incomes for those who already have money. Meanwhile, we're withdrawing stimulus and support for those at the low end. And that is where we are actually seeing the stress. You see it in everything from Walmart commentary to Dollar General commentary, et cetera, right? We are watching more and more stress develop in the system. And I'd say the exact same thing extends into the corporate sector where Apple and Google are benefiting from very high interest rates on their cash balances. That in turn is camouflaging the risks that are occurring throughout the Russell 2000, where we see interest expense climbing very, very rapidly as marginal amounts of capital are, are funded, right? And we're watching the maturity wall on high yield get tighter and tighter and tighter. I mean, people should be really scared by the fact that we're now inside five years on the average maturity for high yield. Like that's a really substantive event when you actually stop and think about the fact that what we're describing is a situation in which there is a growing fraction of companies that can't actually refinance themselves. They just can't do it. How do you square uh, your reading of, let's just say, quality of loans and uh, uh, credit stress in the system with the official statistics, either reported by banks or the Fed, that show for a lot of metrics, like you know, mortgages, uh, delinquencies are, are you know near all time lows or at all time lows, and that for even things like credit cards, where delinquencies have you know doubled or tripled, they're at the, where they were in you know. 2011 and they were they you know from 1990 to 2000 pretty much 2010 they were higher than they are now like yeah you know, like the official statistics aren't are not nearly as bad as you say do you just think that they're 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 early they're behind or sorry they're late they're lagging i i just think these things are, are terribly lagging in their construction mm -hmm. remember until about a month and a half ago you actually were prohibited as a mortgage servicer from declaring somebody being delinquent or in default in many situations Right. We're actually seeing the levels of delinquencies and defaults for FHA type loans, which is where the government is directly involved. We're actually seeing those deteriorate meaningfully. Right. They're deteriorating very rapidly as people who bought new homes last year and anticipated this is, you know, the irony we talk about Wall Street desperately wanting interest rate cuts. The reality is, is Main Street desperately wants the interest rate cuts because the people who bought their homes last year and are looking at the teaser rates that they had expiring, right? Where they were brought into a new home at a 4% or a 5%, you know, 4%, 5% mortgage as compared to the six, seven, eight percent that we're looking at today. They had anticipated being able to refinance and now they can't do it, right? And so that family is suddenly looking at this and saying, wait, the house that we thought was unaffordable, that our realtor assured us we'd be able to refinance when the Fed cut rates, they're actually finding out that that house is unaffordable. And we're seeing this across not just mortgage payments, but we're also seeing it in property taxes. We're seeing it in insurance in Florida, et cetera. Right? These are all sources of stress that are multiplying. And the thing to remember about stress, right? I mean, a fraying string, string or a fraying rope, you don't fall until it actually breaks. You can look at it all you want. You'd be like, wow, that's you know really starting to fray and starting to get really crazy. And eventually it's going to snap. Right, but you're stuck there in suspended animation, hoping that Sylvester Stallone can hold on. I guess you know the thing we learned from from this podcast, if there is nothing else, is Mike had is a great trader of his house. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> selling it right there, right there, spot on at the beat. There we go, uh, Mike. When you look across the asset universe, every, every asset class, and also uh, you know long or short, what are some of the best? opportunities that you see to express the macro view that you've described? The asset class that I keep highlighting for people is tips, both short dated and long dated, particularly if you move to kind of the, you know, if I go out 30 years right now, we're looking at a two and a half percent real yield. It's hard to actually explain to people how favorable that return is, right? The idea that you can just never worry about it again and get two and a half percent on your on your money in real terms. And like your biggest concern is basically that the US government is going to start lying to you in a way that given the opportunity to lie to you over the past couple of years, they actually didn't, right? I mean, that's like if anything else, I should tell you of all the dysfunction we saw, they reported the highest levels of inflation across many categories we've ever seen in history. 
right? Um, in ter- it's certainly in terms of modern. That's not entirely true. 1940s inflation in some areas was more se- more severe. But it, you know, if you actually think about like, what you're looking at, you're talking about locking in returns that for many institutions in particular actually allow them to fulfill almost all of their objectives, right? Imagine you're Harvard or your Princeton or your, you know, any of these large endowments that need to spend 4% of their budget forever, right? And suddenly you're talking about a locked in 2.6% real with an inflation kicker on top of it, you know, for the next 30 years, like it, that's extraordinary. It's a really, really unusual and special situation that is being created. And I think this is actually language that people are underappreciating in terms of this underlying dynamic. The U.S. Treasury is paying a premium right now to try to get inflation under control. They're willing to pay an extraordinarily high rate that slows and decelerates the economy. And you're able to lock in that rate for the next 30 years. That's an extraordinary gift unless you think it has to head a lot higher because the opportunities are much greater. Right. And this is candidly where I grow concerned about the supply dynamics as compared to the demand story, right? The the absolute attractiveness of 2.6% or 2.5% real yields for 30 years. I think Bob would be the first person to say like, yeah, it's absolutely a really, really attractive yield. If you can lock that in, it's a heck of a lot better than gold does, by the way, right? So when you start thinking about those underlying dynamics, right? Like almost every single person agrees. But the long term is when we're all dead. And the question is, what happens in the interim process between here and the next two years in which we need to absorb this extraordinary amount of issuance? And if Bob and I are right, by the way, and actually you do see a recession, the odds that we actually increase the expenditure significantly, that we increase the levels of debt because of falling taxation and the need to introduce countercyclical stimulus, Man, that gets, or that you end up having a, an acceleration of wartime conditions, right? I mean, you are finally starting to hear people cogently begin to evaluate the real effects or the real dynamics of what transpired in 1860 or eight, 1939 when we were forced to confront the reality that we needed to radically change our spending patterns and radically increase the quantity of resources that were going to the government sector, right? Like you're starting to hear people evaluate that. And that, that type of shift was far greater than what we've had this time. The, the expansion of debt to GDP that occurred from 1941 to 1945 makes what we just went through look like absolute nothing. And we managed to accommodate it without a significant increase in yield. Why? Because we force directed, uh, we actually did, you know, you've certainly had these conversations. We actually did do financial repression. This time around, we're like, hey, isn't it great that everybody's off buying the S&P 500 for their retirement accounts? It's a totally different animal. Yep. And uh, just for our viewers, so uh, 2.5% real uh, 30-year tips, uh, Treasury Inflation Protected Security, that means you know, if inflation averages 8% over the next 30 years, you're not being paid 2.5%, you're being paid 2.5 plus 8%. So you'd be paid 10.5%. So it's uh, inflation protection and you, you get that um, uh, duration. Uh, Bob, what do you think about tips? Uh, the 30-year, I mean, that that looks up somewhat uh, attractive. I, I, I don't know where the, the other uh, points on the curve are. And then also, what do you think about another inflation hedge, gold, where the higher real rates are supposed to go? Uh, theoretically, uh, uh, gold sh- should decline in, in, in value because uh, you know gold apparently historically thrives when periods of uh, you know, financial repression, low real low real in, in interest rates. And I, I've also been noting you uh, making a few favorable comments about about, about gold on the uh, on X recently. So yeah, what do you think about tips and gold and their their relative attractiveness? Well, what a what a world we live in where we're talking about tips as the most attractive asset out there in the world, right? I mean, how many? It's been fifteen years. I actually remember. Um, Years and years ago, in the middle of the financial crisis, just for for folks to have some perspective, there were some liquidity issues with tips um, in the fall of 2008. And the yield, I I bought uh, a a cash uh, 20-year tip uh, yielding uh, into the threes, just into the low threes. And I'd argue like that was basically the best financial trade I ever made in my career. You know, we're at 2.6% under relatively benign you know, uh, treasury market conditions here. Um, 
you know, that is a very, a very attractive long-term real return to bake in. I think, you know, probably a little more interesting, shorter on the curve where you can get the similar yield without having to, to take on um, as much volatility. Uh, but, you know, for a long-term saver, two and a half, three percent 3%, uh, in that range without essentially any hold to maturity risk of achieving that is a very attractive outcome. And I think that's particularly interesting and compelling in the context of uh, the fact that odds are we are likely to see a recession when it comes that's going to be a lot more challenging than I think most people expect. Like how many people, when you hear them, they say, well, I think it will be either no or soft landing, or if there's a recession, It'll be, uh, what do they say? They say a mild recession, a shallow recession. You know, you, you, you watch financial television or whatever. Um, and every analyst, you know, basically long only asset managed like shallow recession if it comes, right? Like it, it has been very challenging to slow the economy on the upside with interest rate hikes. Why wouldn't you expect like the same dynamic is true on the downside? Like where are we going to get the stimulation? for this economy on the downside. If we're not sensitive to rates rising, we sure as heck aren't going to be sensitive to rates falling. And so what that means is we're going to need much, you know, this, this recession when it comes will be much harder, much more difficult to stimulate out of than I think a lot of people are expecting. The point is that then connects to the story of tips when you're talking about a 2%, two percent, two point, you know, mid twos real return that you can lock in in the context of an economy that is weakening and will need, you know, it'll be challenging to stimulate. That's a that makes that that return that asset even more compelling than you know just what it might look like on the surface. Now, in that context, you know, gold in many ways is just an, is is another way to gain access to uh, to be essentially to to protect against financial repression. Uh, in one form or another, um, as you know, gold serves as a non-yield bearing contra currency. And so in that sense, I think, you know, gold offers a lot of, uh, you know, is, is, is somewhat compelling in that context, in the event that, you know, financial repression is relatively significant, we start to see the dynamics that that Mike is describing in terms of, if we have to, you know, put ourselves on a wartime footing, etc. And often what you'll see, you know, in I, I like to go back to this in 60% of 12 month periods where stocks are down, gold outperforms bonds or tips. Um, and so, you know, it certainly, does that mean that you should put your whole portfolio in gold? No. Does it mean that you should hold some gold in your portfolio? Because it may be uh, a diversifying asset in a time where equities are not doing well. Like, yes, but, you know, basically no one holds any gold in their portfolio at all. So the the basic idea is, you know, both assets could do very well on a forward looking basis and provide a compelling real return in an environment where we're starting to, you know, where we see uh, the need for financial repression in order to stimulate the economy in a in a down in a downward move. Mike, what do you think about gold? I agree ultimately with Bob that you know gold is largely a bet on real rates, and so what we're both saying, whether it's tips or whether it's gold, is you know we think real rates are probably too high. Um, they also, and this is to Bob's point on the thirty-year right and the opportunity that he had in two thousand eight, when for a very brief period of time, you know the ten-year tip, the thirty-year tip, the twenty-year tip traded on the liquidity basis, and actually there was an interesting wrinkle that's created by deflation as it relates to tips, where there is some concern if you have an appreciated security that it can actually lose principal, right? That floor is against its issuance level, not against its trade, its accumulated value. And, and I have some concerns around that, but I don't, they're not really that significant. Gold is just another way of expressing the same trade, except that in that case, you're making it no one else's liability other than the financial intermediary that you're using to access it. Right. I mean, that's the real value associated with gold is, is it's the only financial asset and quote unquote financial asset that you can take that has no obligation for anyone else to do anything if you take it into your own possession. Mike, what about your favorite asset of all time? Bitcoin. Bitcoin absolutely requires people to keep doing something. Right. I mean, Bitcoin requires all the miners to keep mining away. If they don't, then your flash drive becomes a flash drive instead of, you know, precious and priceless Bitcoin. That's been part of the argument that I've made all along on this, which is they're not actually comparable assets. One remains a liability of the network.
and I think one of the challenges is we just with with Bitcoin, we just don't know how it trades as a financial asset. Like what Mike's saying about you know gold being a bet on real rates is is something that has been established over literally millennia, right? That concept, the trade-off between gold and paper currency and yielding paper currency is something you know that we've that connection, that linkage and dynamic, we've seen it across millennia, across, you know, China, the US, Europe, you know, Japan, like we've seen it in all sorts of different environments over those millennia to be able to, in a very compelling way, understand that that is the the most probable linkage. I think the basic question with Bitcoin is, who knows? Like we haven't even gone through a real recession with Bitcoin, right? Other, I mean, uh, the, the acute dynamics in 2020, but we haven't really seen it. As a simple example, I thought it was very interesting how Bitcoin traded in response to uh, to the to the recent uh, conflict in, in in Israel, right? I thought this was very interesting, which mm. is gold traded up, bonds rallied, and Bitcoin fell. And if if you really think that Bitcoin is a contra currency that's likely to benefit from uh, from you know in, in from rising geopolitical tensions, right? you would have expected it to rally in that environment. And so like, these are the sorts of like, these are, that's a little test case, right? Like how much, you know, gold traded the way it's supposed to. Bonds by and large traded the way they, spo- they were supposed to. Equities the same way. Like how much confidence can you have in an asset that when you have what is essentially, you know, in the, in the obviously it's a terrible circumstance and, and a terrible um, dynamic that's a the terrible situation that's occurring there but it is you know in in a global context it's a relatively modest um con- you know rise in conflict that's occurring and you're seeing the dynamics of the market play out in a way that is inconsistent with what certainly i've been told by the bitcoin community about how it'll trade yes well was it paul Tudor jones who said recently that gold and bitcoin are a geopolitical hedge Sure, but they traded a whole heck of a lot differently, right? And those geopolitical hedges, like the question, the way that you understand it as a geopolitical hedge is based on the fundamentals, which I think Mike has highlighted a very important part of the fundamentals, which is you do have a liability, you know, gold, if it's in your pocket, essentially other than uh, confiscation, uh, is in your pocket, right? You control it, right? It's a liability to no one. Um, whereas, you know, Bitcoin is, is reliant on technology, uh, engaged, you know, run by other people. Um, and so from the fundamental perspective, there's a question, and then it just comes down to the empirics. And that's, that's the point is if you're going to protect yourself from geo rising geopolitical tensions, like one asset has millennia across geographies telling you how it performs. And the other has, you know, nothing essentially no sample size. No, there is no sample size on Bitcoin's performance in rising geopolitical tension. And so if you're a saver, you have to recognize the uncertainty. You don't know how it's going to perform in that environment because we, we haven't observed it. Like your confidence just has to be very, very low in terms of how it'll do it. And the stress test that we saw in the last couple of days was a fail. That's a very short sample sample size. We we, we cited about a recent well, underperformance. That's, actually, that's, that's Jack. That's part of Bob's response, though. I mean, that's part of his, his comment, a, it's right? A, it's a, yes, it's yeah. a short sample size, but, but we don't have any sample, right? I, so, agree, I agree, and also the, the sample size since two thousand nine is is like I would not advise people to say, "Oh, it's averaged a ninety percent or one hundred fifty percent return since two thousand nine. It's like, yeah, well, it was at zero in two thousand nine, so. You know, it's for those for those returns to continue. It's going to have to be five million dollars pretty soon. You know, rising geopolitical tensions. Rising, did it go up or did it go down? Down to to flattish. Did gold go up or down? Gold gold went up. Gold went up. And Bitcoin went up. Gold went up a lot. Gold performed just as it's supposed to perform. And so that's like yeah. But like, we don't have large sample size, and the sampling that we're seeing, the sampling I'm seeing, is inconsistent. With the, with the thesis that's going on. So don't deny the facts, right? Like the way that you're going to paint a compelling picture for this, for Bitcoin as an asset is that it has 
a set of return properties that are consistent with its thesis. The thesis failed, right? The thesis failed. And that is very, very important when you're thinking about it as an asset. Like we can't deny the thesis. We can't deny the empirical evidence when it runs counter to the thesis. I just say we need, we need more, more time, as you say. Like the Bitcoin as an inflation hedge, I think we have enough data for inflation rising in 2022 for it failed but you know it's, it's been a few days so i'm if, if it, that continues then 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 yeah jack i just want to make sure i understood you're saying that you have enough evidence that that bitcoin works as an inflation hedge or it's a fail no as an inflation no, hedge? no that that it failed as an inflation hedge at least if you um you know don't do any any lags which some people do i personally agree with that there's a lot of people that would point to the rise that it experienced in 2020 and say oh it was a fantastic inflation hedge it yep. just predicted it in advance right yep, that's what I meant by um, you mentioned paul peter jones right you know it's the best of the inflation trades no it actually just has this goes back to exactly the points that i was making around target date funds or systematic allocation strategies it has the most vociferous and you know uh, maniacal holding base that basically is unwilling to supply any as the price goes higher, right? It has that characteristic that as it goes up, people are convinced that it's actually demonstrating the validity of their arguments, and therefore they're more willing to hold as it goes higher in price. That's just another way of saying it's it's highly inelastic in its construction, right? And when it goes down, people turn around and say the exact same thing. Oh, look, this is just proof. This is what it does, right? And you know, it shows your emotional and mental character to be able to hold it through periods of time when it's falling in price, right? So it's an asset that appreciates when it goes up and it tests your metal and makes you a stronger human being when it goes down, right? It's a it's a man for all seasons, perfect. Just, I mean, but just go again to the empirics around the geopolitical hedge. Like how did it do in 2022? Uh, very poorly. I think, very it, poor. I, th I think it was down. <laughs> yeah, it was d definitely down. Part of the reason why I'm emphasizing this is that um, we owe it as respected commentators giving, giving perspective on how financial assets work. We owe it to people to speak plainly and literally and truthfully about how things perform in different market environments, right? To recognize when there's uncertainty, but also mm -hmm. to highlight when things um, are playing out in a certain way, because it is critical as fiduciaries, and I mean that sort of in a broad sense of fiduciaries, that we don't that we that we represent the reality to people, whether you like you know whether we like the reality or not, whether we're right or wrong on our trades, right? And so I think it's this is a good example where there is a lot of uncertainty, and where I think we can. There's a lot of uncertainty, and frankly, there's a lot of misinformation, critically wrong misinformation in the market that's being presented to people, where we have a responsibility to be very clear about how things are working, and to, and particularly when we see these stress tests, and to, to call balls and strikes, um, whether we like it or not. Right, whether it's you know whether it's it helps our pocketbook or not, call the balls and strikes on how, for instance, this asset is performing relative to the theses that exist. And I continue, I repeatedly am are seeing, I'm repeatedly seeing in these scenarios the thesis being the theses being rejected by the empirical evidence. And so that that you know that that's just the functional reality of the circumstance. I'm open minded. You know, I saw some indications that maybe it was trading with gold for a very short period of time uh, earlier in the year. But, you know, when we get these stress test cases, like it, it, it's, it's, um, we have to speak plainly about the realities. What do you think about how high unemployment rate will go during this cycle? Mike, you've been doing a lot of work on how the labor market might not be as strong as it appears with their 3.8% unemployment rate. Um, and, you know, Bob, you somewhat you know, lampooned uh, the mild recession case that folks are talking about. But, I mean, why, why can't we have a recession where, you know, in uh, to the early 2000s recession where the unemployment rate peaked at 6.0%? 6, 6 
or 6.3 percent honestly to me now that we're at 3.8 percent that seems high but for unemployment peaks it's it's actually quite low would that that, that would be might be a mild recession um what, what do you think mike one i don't think it matters very much i think bob actually said that very well right if you don't experience it the, the, you know this is the perverse argument so another participant in the discussions that we have all the time is Warren Mosler um, of MMT fame, who correctly points out that higher interest rates and higher interest payments from the government are a transfer to the non-public sector, to the, to the private sector and the foreign sector, and in many ways can be perceived as stimulus. Um, I think that's absolutely true, right? If you give sugar to your children over and over and over again, you will stimulate them and stimulate them. They're going to get wilder and wilder and wilder in their behavior. And you're going to be like, wow, this is fantastic. Let me give them even more sugar. And then you go to reach for the sugar bowl. And by the time you turn around, they've crashed comatose on the floor, right? Um, there is only so long that actually goes and the actual level of interest rates, I would argue, is creating its own risk factors at this point. So to answer your question very specifically, remember that unemployment has two components to it. It has people who are already working who lose their jobs and it has new people coming into the labor force who want to find jobs but can't. The story of the 1970s was largely the latter. It was an explosive growth of the labor force where we, be, we engaged, particularly from monetary policy, in very restrictive behaviors that ultimately meant that people that wanted to work and wanted to contribute found themselves unable to because the openings were simply not there. This time around, we have extraordinarily low growth in the labor force. And as a result, that's unlikely to push. By the way, 2008 actually had symptoms of that as well, because the modal millennials were coming into the labor force in size in that time period. That contributed to the elevated levels of unemployment that we experienced. So, you know, as I look at this cycle, I think, and I've, I've been explicitly writing about this, I think it's harder to get that second component, that push of new entrants into the labor force who are saying, I can't find the jobs that I want, and therefore unemployment rises. Immigration is perversely one of those sources of labor force growth that if the economy weakens, that actually slows down. People are less willing to make that transit unless it turns into something really horrific like we saw in the night in, in the uh, uh, recessionary conditions following the Spanish flu in World War I, where there was an incredible amount of displacement. There are some indications that, 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 that there are elements of that playing out today, but I don't think that that's actually the, the dominant story. I think the dominant story that exists is the general aging of the labor force, the general aging of our population, and the associated very slow growth in labor force that means we just don't need that many jobs to keep unemployment low. So at least superficially, that's maybe good news. The unemployment rate will stay lower than normal uh, over the next recession. And then also, uh, you agree with Warren Mosler that uh, high interest rates are stimulative on the fiscal side, but what about the, via the credit channel of banks? And and, and particularly, you know, now that mortgage rates are at eight percent instead of three percent, mortgage demand and mortgage you know applications are, are have fallen off a cliff. Uh, would would you contend that the credit tightening via the bank credit channel is more uh, inflicts more tightening than the does the stimulative effect of the fiscal when you when you raise interest rates? I think it depends. And this is the unfortunate reality in all responses on this stuff, right? If you get a degree of fiscal stimulus that radically changes, and remember what we actually did with this fiscal stimulus is we injected equity. So we called something a PPP loan and then we forgave it, right? That's just a handout. That's a direct injection of equity into the corporate sector. You don't have to pay anything back for that injection. Um, and you know, if something like that happens, that equivalent of true helicopter drop money, who knows, right? I mean, the, the way that those things behave in aggregate is relatively predictable, but in the individual basis, a little bit harder. Um, on the, the dynamic of credit, I think this is part of what both Bob and I were saying is, is, is you know, perversely, if I cut interest rates at this point, am I adding value to the system or am I cutting incomes in the process? And the question becomes, you know, it is actually highly, um, uh, it, it is highly asymmetric in its behavior or convex in its behavior. If you were to cut interest rates by 50 basis points, 
that would likely have more impact in terms of allowing people to, by steepening the curve under that model, you would actually likely drive an increase in purchasing of longer dated bonds because as you invert, you uninvert mm -hmm. the curve, it becomes feasible for me to finance a 10 year bond by borrowing at the shorter end. Right? That's one of the key things that I think is actually limiting demand for longer term treasuries right now, bonds, mm -hmm. is the fact that you really can't finance them very effectively. Right. But as people wake up to the reinvestment risk, and I think this is part of where Bob is is spot on when he says it takes time. Right. But as people wake up and say, wait, I can't get five and a half percent in the money market forever. Right. And the Fed is going to ultimately be forced to cut rates. And suddenly I'm faced with can I reasonably expect two percent? Can I reasonably expect one percent? Oh, my God, they're going all the way back to zero. And I don't know if that, that that's where they're going, right? But certainly very smart mm -hmm. people like Alex Gurvich would suggest that that's the case. And there's reasonable reasons to believe that that is actually the case. But if they're forced to ultimately do that, then suddenly everyone who is looking at their cash balance sheets and saying, wow, isn't this fantastic? On every million dollars, I'm now suddenly making $55,000 a year. If they're suddenly, wait, wait a second, I'm getting zero again. Like, what's the impact of that? It's not until we get through the entire economic signal and it becomes clear that you can actually offer um, credit to people again and that they're going to be capable of servicing it from the incomes that they have, which, by the way, you just de declared are falling, right? If you actually are creating, you have to get through the entire cycle before people can begin tapping the credit cycle again. And that's, that's one of the reasons why Bob is spot on. He's like, where the hell do you think we are in the cycle? Of course, we're at the end of the cycle, right? The, the, the one thing that I would point out that actually I think is, again, like these are all things that are changing. Banks are far less important in the credit cycle than they used to be, right? I mean, that was part of the point that I was making if you go back to World War II. In World War II, the financing mechanism was basically the U.S. government saying to banks, you will buy this. Right, and we're going to make it possible for you to finance any amount of it that you want. Right, um, but if you want to lend money to somebody to buy a car, no, absolutely not going to happen. You want to lend money to build a factory to build tanks, hundred percent, go for it. Right, but you want to lend money to somebody to buy a car or finance a house, yeah, no, not that's not that's not a priority for us right now. Right, but right now, perversely, what we actually have is we have a private market that just like Bitcoin we're talking about in the private credit space, they've never been through a cycle. And so they're actually looking at these assets suddenly like, oh my gosh, this is the most wonderful use of capital we've ever seen, right? And by the way, I lived through that before. You guys have heard me tell the story. I mean, Bob mentioned 2000, 2008. You know, Go back and look at what happened at TIPS in 1999, 2000, when they were first introduced and nobody had any interest in them because they were all distracted by dot-com stocks. Right. You got to even higher levels for tens at that point than you are today by a pretty wide margin without any real forms of stress. Right. I mean, other than just absolute neglect. So could we get there again? No questions asked. Absolutely. But if I go to 2008 and I remember the summer of 2008, the excitement at being able to deploy capital at 95 cents on the dollar in the senior loan market, I feel like this is the greatest opportunity of all time. And we're watching that exact behavior again, right? Where the private credit space just is falling all over themselves to lend out money. Now, some of it is actually going to be really good investments because there are really elements of distress. But we're seeing this in commercial real estate right now where it's being appraised down 75% in some situations. I, I'm sorry, that's not a credit discussion. That's a bankruptcy court resolution. Yes, and... I think you're absolutely right. So much of the loans is now on the private side. Uh, but that, a silver lining of that is that if the loans that go bad are not owned by banks, then there's less uh, systemic risk. That's a potential uh, silver lining. Bob, Bob, what do you what do you think about this whole credit credit channel? Because yes, fiscal uh, higher interest rates are stimulative to people who are have money at a, a money market account. But presumably, if you, you know, think it's late cycle, you think so because of the rise of interest rates and the lag, you know, we're, we're, we're finally there. You know, people have been talking about an inverted curve since the spring of 2022. It's been a long time. Um, and that's you know, presumably, I presume, why you think it's a uh, late cycle. We, we've seen credit meaningfully slowed, actually, 
last year. Like uh, a lot of people, certainly in the banking system, a lot of people are were really focused on SVB. Like essentially nothing happened before and after SVB. Like all the credit slowing happened last year. Um, you know, we went from banks in 2022 extending credit at a very rapid pace to basically zero um, by by early 2023. And that's reflect that's a typical macroeconomic dynamic that occurs uh, when you get a tightening, just in the same way we saw the bond market slow, bond market issuance slow, which is another credit market dynamic. Um, but, you know, as as Mike points out, there's there's um, there's still the sort of uh, reasonable amount of liquidity in the system and combined with um, with a, a set of financial asset infrastructures that don't force mark to market uh, are creating what, you know, what has been a bit of a boom in the private credit space um, that is sort of continuing the cycle, uh, you know, on the margin and and maybe not even really continuing the economic cycle so much as holding up asset prices, particularly in illiquid securities. But for those folks who have been around a little while and have seen this dynamic play out, which is, you know, lending the incremental, the last lending, the last dollar to the soon to be bankrupt entity. We know how this ends, which is, you know, you, you have good marks for a few months or a few years, and then you lose your shirt on. Um, and that's probably what we're likely to see. And that I think, uh, interestingly, um, the fact that we haven't seen a real credit cycle in the private credit markets is, I think, exacerbating the capital that's flowing into those places and will uh will mean that there's much many more much more significant losses uh in the future as a result rather than if people really had a good fundamental understanding of what credit cycles work i i talked to some private credit folks um who will with i believe a straight face tell me that private credit is an uncorrelated asset to the equity market and that is crazy. Like that is total lunacy. I mean, look, it's, it's the same thing that we hear with the private equity space, right? We hear all the same language that these are uncorrelated assets, that they're less volatile. Look, there is no way you can say anything else. At the end of the day, credit is writing puts. At the end of the day, private equity is levered equity right? It can't have less volatility. Mechanically, it can't have less volatility. It can have lower observed volatility because you only check your bank statement. It's the equivalent of checking your brokerage statement every quarter. And by the way, the bank having the flexibility to smooth the results over a trailing 36-month period, right? Um, inevitably choosing to mark up as compared to mark down. But the simple reality is you can't escape. This is actually what I wrote my last Substack about. You can't escape the logic of payoff structures. If you're engaged in private equity and you're levering equity, by definition, you've constructed the capital structure so that you're effectively long a series of call options. Your losses on call options tend to be 100%. right? And that's really kind of the underlying story. So valuations fall as we're seeing you see those remarkably impinged. And now we're going a step further down the road with things like NAV loans, G GP commitment loans, et cetera, where what we're really trying to do is preserve the option value for the LP, the limited, the, the GPM, sorry, rather than the LPs. There is actions that are going on that I would argue are empirically non-fiduciary in their underlying construction that won't come out until we have the equivalent of a PCORA commission for private equity. And that's hard to pull off in today's political environment. So what's an NA NAB loan? <laughs> exactly. Um, an NAV loan is the equivalent of levering up the fund as compared to the individual asset, right? So what you're actually doing is, is you're saying, okay, we have fund number six, and we no longer have the capacity to inject enough equity into company B in fund number six so that we can obtain refinancing under the more restrictive credit terms today. So what we're going to do is we're going to take out a loan against the equity value, the NAV value of fund six, and we're then going to plow those proceeds into company B as an equity injection 
that allows us to relever company B, refinance company B at a um, reasonable interest rate that it can that it can service. But I've improved the credit quality. I've improved the documents that give the creditors claims against the equity that otherwise I could theoretically monetize. Right, and so it, it's a way of adding. It's a way of adding leverage that is in. It, it, in all circumstances, other than the call options pay off, right? You get the right outcome. It is adverse to the interests of the of your investors. For the, again, for those of us who've been around for a while, credit innovation is bad for investors. When a creator of an innovative credit instrument is coming to you, right? You should stay away. Because what's happening <laughs> is they're repackaging risk in one form or another right. to get paid, right? They're not serving as a fiduciary. Mm -hmm. They're not serving as a fiduciary. They're serving their interest, which is to support their organization or earn fee income. But they're not creating something that will be beneficial. And their fee income is the percentage of the value. Uh, so they have an interest in the value being high and they choose what the value is. They, they, they mark the, the value. Right. Yeah. Mike, sorry, sorry I, I heard NAB loan and NAV loan. Um, got it. Uh, gentlemen, you, you've been very generous with your time. My final question for you is that right now, I'm just looking at the CME uh, Fed funds probabilities and futures, and it's, it's predicted that uh, in a little over a year, so December 2024, let's just call it a year, uh, the Federal Reserve will have cut close to 100 basis points, so four cuts from where we are right now. Do you would you bet that the Federal Reserve cuts be, uh, more than that, less than that, or is that roughly accurate? Uh, Bob, let's start with you because you've been uh, talking about for for a long time how shorting the two year has been a good trade, and it has been a, a very good trade with the benefit of hindsight. At the beginning of our conversation, you said that something like the easy money has already been made shorting the two year, but based on your economic outlook, it actually sounds like you're willing to go maybe a little bit further than that and saying uh, maybe. The Fed is going to cut by a lot. So maybe two years are time not to short twos, but perhaps go long them. So what's your view, Bob, first, then, then you, Mike? Uh, this is probably going to uh, not be that exciting uh, an ending, but 100 base points, I don't know, give or take, seems in the ballpark of what's reasonable given the various uh, dynamics going on. There's a, there's a trade-off between what will likely be, you know, a macroeconomic slowing with, um, with, uh, with also on the other side, there's still concerns about inflation uh, and the durability of inflation there. And so that might cause the Fed to be a little slower on the on the cutting side uh, than they would otherwise be seeing the same sort of growth conditions. And so, you know, you don't you, key thing to remember when you're trading markets, you don't have to trade every market. You don't have to uh -huh. trade every position. You don't have to trade every price. And there's a lot of times when you look at something and you're like, eh, you know, could go this way, could go that way. Not that compelling a trade, at least as you're seeing it right now. So, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to skirt out of it. It's just that that doesn't seem where, seem like it's where the the compelling money is going to be made. So, where is the compelling money, uh, Bob? What is the compelling trade? You already talked about gold. We talked about tips. If it's not in the two year, is it in the ten year? Is it in particular part, parts of the stocks, it's shorting stocks. What, what, what is your, you know, what are your favorite trades? The, re the real place that's interesting is, is long bonds relative to stocks like that at a, in a, in a structural sense, that's basically, and I, I would also emphasize, you don't, you can construct trades however you want to construct them, right? Like using the pieces that exist. So if, if I like that trade, there's no reason why I can't have that trade. You put that trade on that, that to me just seems like a more compelling story in the market today than than the precise amount of cuts that you're betting on the precise amount of cuts that the fed's going to do uh in in you know 15 months makes sense mike what do you think so again i think this is one of these interesting situations where by and large i actually agree with bob right and so when you talk about the dynamics of like does the fed cut 100 basis points does it cut more does it cut less i gotta be honest with you, i don't think it really matters all that much right i mean you're either going to be correct about the overwhelming you know, observation that the economy is slowing and therefore equities are likely to be under more pressure or that more people are going to wake up to the idea that bonds are compelling relative to equities for any number of reasons, right? And, and my hunch is, is that this is going to look an awful lot like what happened in the dot-com cycle where, you know, 
that you came into December of 1999, it was already very clear. Like everybody knew that this was nonsense, right? That, you know, that, that, that this was not going to happen. It's no different, by the way, than what we saw in February of 2021 when, you know, everyone sat there going, gosh, can you actually believe that people think GameStop is this extraordinary, you know, entity, et cetera, right? Like nobody actually believed it. It's just people were terrified of it. Right. And so now the question becomes, do you actually see the investors or the investor committees that have some discretion? Do they have the time and capability to sit down in February of this year and say, hey, we're going to change our allocations? Right. We're going to reduce our future commitments to private equity. We're going to reduce our future commitments to X, Y, Z. And we're going to decide that we're going to buy relatively low risk bonds in the form of tips that meet or the tips or other types of bonds, right, that meet our investment objectives, but require us to actually take a risk, right? Because they have to look at their historical allocation models and say, we're going to make a change, right? And that's, that's harder to do than anyone wants to acknowledge, right? I keep using the Vanguard target date funds, and I don't mean to specifically pick on Vanguard, except that was a lie. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> the, you know, the really critical point is like, you, you know, imagine the process of sitting down in a Vanguard, you know, uh, investment committee meeting, be like, okay, do we change our target date fund allocations? How? What do you do? Like, just mechanically think through how many marketing communications you have to rewrite and re-communicate, right? And you have to suddenly start saying, well, we don't really engage in market timing, but we are going to engage in market timing now, right? You know, we see it as it's it's impossible. It's actually impossible. And so it requires a confluence of factors to occur. But perversely, when it begins to happen, it can very rapidly snowball. And I used the example of if the Fed cuts by 100 basis points, then, it, you know, like I, I look at one of our products, and I know Bob has products out there as well. But like, I look at our product in twos, our levered two year product, if the Fed cuts interest rates by 100 basis points, that thing turns into a yield monster. I mean, it just turns into a yield monster, right? Because of the steepness of the curve and the dynamics of how it's financed, right? And so that starts to make these things perversely more attractive as interest rates get cut. We don't really know how that plays out, right? And when people decide that bonds are more attractive, to Bob's point, do they start selling equities? In what manner do they start selling equities? Do they start selling equities because they sat down in the investment committee meeting and decided they're going to change the allocations? Are those allocations conditional that say, well, we're going to reallocate towards bonds as long as bond yields remain above 5%. But if bond yields get to 2%, no, we're not going to change anything, right? I, I, I've never seen that model happen. Bob, have you ever seen anyone do that, right? You know, where it, it becomes, it's like, well, we're going to change all of our behaviors unless the market gets there first. Right. Um, and so like these things tend to have persistence to them that unfortunately create many of the cycles that we're we're describing. And again, like, you know, the 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 mistake that I tend to make all the time in just the the, the simplest form is you know, presuming that people are going to actually be able to see this as it's so painfully obvious. Bob has done a great job of saying, Hey, be patient and wait, there's no rush. And the thing that I would really push people on is like, remember that, that this is by and large a supply story. There's not an economic signal. There is no evidence that, you know, markets are suddenly pricing in much higher earnings or much higher earnings power, um, which you would expect to be reflected in dividend yields. It's just not there, right? This is a price action mechanical component that's a function of an increase in supply without a concomitant increase in demand. And the flip side of that equation on the equity front, where companies are aggressively buying back nearly a trillion dollars worth of shares this year, right? That shrinks the supply of equities at the same time that the supply of bonds is growing. If I'm running a portfolio that has to remain balanced, I create those jaws without any impact from earnings. You know, it's it's funny, Mike. You mentioned ninety nine as a as an analog. And uh, you know, yes, it's true. You know, the companies now ha have much higher earnings power than you know Pets.com, but it's an interesting analog because yields are so high and the equity risk premium is is so low. And I, I was thinking about uh, on, on YouTube, I saw a lecture at an investment conference by a veteran investor talking about how he just sold 
uh, you know, maybe half of his stocks and bought bonds because he made that allocation decision. You know, he was advanced in his age. It was his, his decision. And uh, that man was, was actually Jack Bogle, the founder of Vanguard. <laughs> yeah, that's no, I mean, Jack, Jack actively engaged in market timing. He knew this was not true. But again, like when you're going to do, you know, this is one of the, the real problems. And, and, you know, Andy and I, Andy Cosan and I had a really nice conversation yesterday. Like it's really critical that people understand that when you seek out beta, right, you're going to get the performance of beta. And what Bogle was actually saying is it's too costly for most people to try to obtain alpha, right? That the entire idea behind alpha is it's supposed to be information intensive. It's supposed to require an extraordinary amount of time. If it was as simple as logging on to Twitter and, you know, hooking up with the latest smart guy who says, you know, here's what I think is going to happen, right? Then it would cease to be, you know, the, like the, the game actually goes away. What I think we're largely experiencing is a collective hallucination not dissimilar to Bitcoin, where if everybody decides to buy, guess what happens to the price? It goes up, right? If an increase in supply happens and we don't concomitantly increase demand, guess what happens? Price goes down, right? There's, there's not like magic and signal in that. And I, I just think that's the that to me is the most frightening aspect of this because we have an element of collective hallucination that these things actually mean something. Mike, so you're also, I should mention, the uh, portfolio manager for the FIG ETF. And you also, uh, people should check out your, your writings at yes, I give a fig, F-I-G, uh, dot com on Substack. Bob, I'll give, give you the final word just because Mike mentioned paying for alpha. And I understand you at Unlimited and through your products, I believe your ETF is HFND, target that. How do you try and uh, get alpha, but also try and not pay too much for it? What are, what are your goals? Just tell us you know, quickly about that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what we do at Unlimited is we're um, we're we're basically using some techniques to uh, understand how hedge fund managers are positioned uh, in the market, and then take that understanding and translate it into long and short positions in uh, liquid securities that can be used to uh, back an ETF uh, that we have out in the market. And, and the basic idea being that if we can use technology to do a pretty good job of understanding how managers are positioned. We can offer it a much lower fee structure than typical uh, two and twenty style uh, positions or individual manager exposures, and and over time that should lead to a a better return than paying you know having concentrated positions in uh, very expensive single manager structures. And so uh, that's what we're doing with Unlimited and and put out our first product and building out a suite of products around that idea. If you know, should definitely check out. Uh, unlimitedfunds.com if if people want to learn more about uh, what we're doing and, and whether the products are right for them. Great. Uh, thanks again, Bob and Mike. Uh, people can find you on Twitter at Bob E. Unlimited and uh, at Prof Plum 99 on Twitter. Uh, thanks again, guys, and thanks everyone for watching. Forward Guidance, the program you just enjoyed, hopefully, can be viewed on YouTube at BlockWorks Macro or heard as a podcast on Apple Podcast and Spotify. Episodes are typically released on Apple and Spotify a few hours before they air on YouTube. Please leave a review on Apple Podcast if you feel so inclined.